Thank you. I'm pleased to speak about COVID-19 treatment. I have no disclosures. To understand COVID-19, we need to understand the clinical course of the disease and identify possible places for interventions. Someone acquires the virus at time zero and their viral load level of SARS-CoV-2 increases. Two to seven days later, they will develop symptoms and the viral load level reaches its highest levels at that point. Some patients will progress and SARS-CoV-2 will induce a cytokine storm with a profound inflammatory response, which can lead to respiratory failure and end organ disease over the course of five days. As ARDS occurs, some proportion of patients will progress and some will go on to death. So the approach to treating COVID-19 is to intervene at one or more portions of this clinical course. Antivirals, we know from other respiratory diseases, may have their best effect if used early on in the course of disease. Once the cytokine storm is brewing or has occurred, immunomodulators could dampen or interfere with that response. And then finally, when tissue damage of the lung or other end organs occurs, issues of tissue repair agents could help. So let's review these. It's fair to say there are no approved treatments for COVID-19 today, and our current standard of care is simply supportive, oxygen, antipyretics, et cetera. Interestingly, bacterial co-infections are initially rare. However, they may complicate a prolonged ICU stay. But there are many candidate treatments, antivirals, immunomodulators, antithrombotics, and cellular therapies. And I'd like to review some of these for you today. Let's go with antivirals. So to understand them, we need to understand the life cycle of SARS-CoV-2. Here's the virus over on the left with its spike protein, and here's the target cell with the ACE2 receptor sitting on the surface of the cell. And initially, this would be a respiratory epithelial cell. SARS-CoV-2 binds to the ACE2 receptor, and then a protease inhibitor acts to facilitate both attachment of the virus and fusion and endocytosis. The viral particle is then inside the cytoplasm, but uncoats, releasing its genetic material in the form of RNA, which is used for two purposes. One is it's transcribed to additional copies of viral RNA, and a second, it's translated to viral proteins. These components assemble within the cytoplasm, migrate to the surface of the cell, and then are released into the system and may bind to another cell that they may come in contact with infecting that cell. So the approach to antivirals has been to interfere with one or more steps of the life cycle of the virus. Entry inhibitors target that step early in the life cycle. Protease inhibitors target the translation and processing of viral proteins. RNA polymerase inhibitors interfere with transcribing. And uh, there are examples of all of these that have been tested. The antiviral agent with the best track record so far is an investigational antiviral called remdesivir. This is an RNA polymerase inhibitor that's an adenine derivative, so a nucleoside analog. It shows in vitro and animal data showing antiviral activity against SARS, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID. This compound was around in the time of Ebola, and actually there was a large clinical trial of over 500 participants, so establishing a safety record for remdesivir. It's available only intravenously. There have been clinical trials now reported in COVID-19. Initially, a small study of compassionate use, but the definitive study was sponsored by the US NIH called the ACT-1 study of over 1,000 people, and I'll share those results on the next slide. They were positive in severe COVID-19, and that led the US FDA to release remdesivir, an investigational agent, through a program called the Emergency Use Authorization. So here is the NIH study, the ACT-3 
phase three clinical study. It's multi-center, randomized, double-blind, and placebo-controlled, so the highest quality of evidence. It enrolled over 1,000 adults hospitalized with COVID-19 with evidence of lower respiratory tract involvement, and they were randomized to receive remdesivir or a placebo. This was given intravenously over the course of 10 days. The study endpoint was time to clinical recovery, that is to discharge or ready for discharge. The graph shows the proportion of people in each group who recovered, and you can see more than 50% of all participants recovered, but more people in the remdesivir group shown in blue compared to the placebo group shown in orange, and this reached a high degree of statistical significance favoring remdesivir. Among the individual groups, the subgroup that did the best were those who were hospitalized and receiving oxygen. And you can see that the point estimate and the 95% confidence interval fall in the range favoring remdesivir in terms of clinical improvement. Notably, people who are mechanically ventilated or on ECMO, this did not, in this subgroup, reach statistical significance. Overall, they concluded that remdesivir is superior to placebo. There have been other studies of remdesivir reported. One in severe COVID looked at just under 400 people who were randomized to different durations of remdesivir, five versus 10 days, and found no significant difference between those two lengths of therapy. And then in a similar study, people were enrolled with moderate COVID which they defined as an oxygen saturation greater than 94%, but with documented pneumonia. They were randomized to either five or 10 days of remdesivir or the standard of care. And what did they find? Well, in terms of clinical improvement at day 11, the primary endpoint of the study, remdesivir with a duration of five days was statistically significantly superior to no remdesivir. And you can see that for you here. However, interestingly, the 10 day duration was not different than the standard of care, not significantly different. There were no new safety signals on the study and overall they concluded that the clinical status benefit did occur in moderate COVID-19, but questioned the clinical relevance. Remdesivir currently is intravenous, but subcutaneous and inhaled formulations are under study. And I received this from a colleague in India, generic remdesivir not now available in developing countries. What about hydroxychloroquine? This is an FDA approved drug for the treatment of malaria and some autoimmune diseases, including lupus. Interestingly, it shows antiviral activity against SARS-CoV-2 in vitro and has immunomodulatory effects. So this was a candidate compound early on for COVID-19. Well, what do we know? Early on, there were case reports, cohort studies, and small clinical trials, some of which showed benefit, but the data were conflicting, and they did see some potential for cardiac toxicity. There have been at least four large retrospective studies that found no benefit, two from New York State, one from the US Veterans Administration, and a large global study of over 14,000 people. However, that study was later retracted, reminding us that COVID is going so fast that sometimes even published data may not be verified. The highest standard of care, though, would be randomized clinical trials, and we now have those for hydroxychloroquine. In this study from Brazil, over 600 hospitalized people with COVID were randomized to hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin versus standard of care, and the primary endpoint showed no difference in clinical outcomes at day 15 and more adverse events in the hydroxychloroquine group. Another study from the UK, which is the largest study yet done, randomized over 4,700 hospitalized patients with COVID to receive hydroxychloroquine or not. And the primary endpoint, no difference in 28-day mortality between the two groups. What about earlier stages? Could you use hydroxychloroquine in non-hospitalized patients? Well, a study from the US enrolled over 400 non-hospitalized patients with COVID 
to hydroxychloroquine or placebo and showed no difference in symptom severity or the risk of hospitalization. And finally, a study in Spain of non-hospitalized patients randomized them to hydroxychloroquine or no treatment and found no difference in terms of viral load reduction, hospitalization, or time to symptom resolution. Taken together, these suggest that there is no data to support using hydroxychloroquine in either hospitalized or non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19. What about the HIV protease inhibitors? Well, of course, they're FDA approved. They do show activity against SARS-CoV-2 in the test tube. However, the pharmacokinetics of lopinavir riptonavir do not support its use for COVID-19. Why? Because you need 100-fold greater concentrations than you can achieve by taking the swallowing the pills of lopinavir riptonavir to achieve inhibitory concentrations against SARS-CoV-2. There was one published randomized controlled study from China that enrolled just under 200 hospitalized patients with severe COVID-19, randomized them to lopinavir, ritonavir or not, and they showed no difference in clinical endpoints of improvement, mortality, or detectable viral RNA. What about darunavir? Well, these, this is test tube data. Up top, we're looking at remdesivir, and you can see at concentrations that are achievable, you get 100% inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 in the test tube. Down below is darunavir, and you see no inhibition at all of SARS-CoV-2, even up to very high levels of darunavir. So the conclusion is that darunavir has no effect on SARS-CoV-2. There's an investigational agent called favipiravir, which is another RNA polymerase inhibitor. It has in vitro activity against a number of viruses, including SARS-CoV-2, and is approved in Japan for influenza. Some preliminary reports, both from China, suggest activity in COVID-19. These support moving forward with phase two studies of favipiravir, which are in progress around the world. What about antibody therapy? So the strategy of convalescent plasma is when you collect plasma from people who've recovered from an illness and then administer it to people with the illness in hopes that the preformed antibodies will decrease the severity of the illness. This strategy has been used for over 100 years. And most recently, convalescent plasma was used in influenza, the original SARS, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and even Ebola, and showed some advantages. There are potential risks of using convalescent plasma, including antibody-dependent enhancement of infection and allergic reactions. Well, what do we know? Randomized clinical trials, there's been three. The design was convalescent plasma versus the standard of care. A small study in China showed no clinical benefit, but they had to stop that study early because of the decreasing cases in China. There was another study randomized in the Netherlands. They too stopped early, could not demonstrate clinical benefit, but they noted that the patients that they enrolled had antibody levels that were similar to the convalescent plasma that they were going to administer, and they stopped their study. More recently, a randomized study was released from India in preprint form over 460 people randomized to convalescent plasma or not, and they showed no difference in severity of disease or mortality. Well, the clinical use has been reported in additional retrospective cohorts, but again, these can be subject to bias. We do have a large safety record from the United States through an expanded access program. A total of over 20,000 patients have been reported and they have shown very few, if any, side effects in this group. However, no conclusions about efficacy could be made because there was no control. Nevertheless, the US FDA authorized the release of convalescent plasma through the expanded use authorization with the uh, justification that it, quote, may be effective. They also caution that it does not represent a new standard of care and what we need are prospective randomized clinical trials to demonstrate efficacy, and those are in progress right now. What about cytokine inhibitors? Can we interfere 
with the cytokine storm induced by SARS-CoV-2? Well, the best data we have in COVID-19 is for dexamethasone, the corticosteroid. This comes again from the large recovery study in the UK, where they've enrolled over 11,000 patients with COVID at 175 National Health Service hospitals. In this part of the study, over 6,400 people who were hospitalized with COVID-19 participated. They were randomized to receive dexamethasone, six milligrams a day for 10 days or until discharge versus the usual care. And you can see literally thousands of people in each group. The primary endpoint was 28 day mortality and you can see 23% on dexamethasone versus 26% who did not receive dexamethasone uh, ended up dying during the course of the study. This was a significant difference and the study was stopped early by the trial steering committee. The difference between the two is shown for you here. If you look at all participants, you can see that the benefit was a 17% reduction in mortality. However, even greater benefits were seen in subsets of patients. So the sickest people who were mechanically ventilated or on ECMO experienced a 35% reduction in the risk of mortality with dexamethasone. And the group that received oxygen only experienced a 20% decrease in mortality. So overall, the investigators concluded dexamethasone is associated with a mortality benefit in patients requiring oxygen, and this has now become the standard of care. While other approaches have been specific immunomodulators, and interleukin-6 was a primary target. Ceruliumab is an interleukin-6 antagonist, and there were published retrospective cohort studies and case series that suggested benefit of using this compound. However, recently, and all we know is a press release, a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase three study of ceruliumab showed no difference in clinical improvement uh, compared with the placebo arm. And a related compound, tocilizumab, also an IL-6 antagonist, again, cohort and case series suggested benefit, but overall the phase three study, which was placebo controlled, showed no difference in clinical improvement or mortality. So IL-6 antagonists not recommended in COVID. A number of other approaches are under exploration, interleukin-1 antagonists, BTK inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors. And recent suggestive data came from a phase three study of baricitinib in the presence of remdesivir, showing a modest benefit compared to remdesivir alone. Again, this is in the form of a press release, and we look forward to reviewing full data on that approach. Lastly, cellular therapies. If you have damage to the lungs or to distant end organs, can there be a benefit in trying novel approaches? So current studies are underway with mesenchymal stem cells, human vein umbilical cord cells, or natural killer T cells. And these are all currently under study. So what can we say in conclusion about the treatment of COVID-19 today in 2020? There are no current approved treatments for COVID-19. However, remdesivir has shown clinical benefit in hospitalized COVID patients on oxygen, but not intubated. And dexamethasone has shown a mortality benefit in hospitalized COVID-19 patients requiring oxygen with the greatest benefit in those who were ventilated or on ECMO. Additional antivirals, antibodies, immunomodulators, and cellular therapies are under study. I'd like to refer you to the NIH treatment guidelines. The web address is shown for you here. These are kept up to date. I'm proud to be one of the co-chairs of these, and uh, they are a wonderful resource to find the latest on treatment of COVID-19. And lastly, I'll just recognize my institution and a number of colleagues who helped with slides for this presentation. Thank you for your attendance.